My paper explores what I hypothesize might be a trend in recent TV legal drama, to self-consciously tap into and ambiguate the convention of political issue orientation that exists in the genre, its capacity to engage with political issues. This convention of what Matthias Kutzina poignantly calls social issue courtroom drama has been well researched around programs ranging from the 1960s original The Defenders to, for example, the practice around the turn of the millennium. The open references in such texts to current political debates, their fictional dramatization of issues ripped from the headlines. I suggest that some legal dramas in the new millennium invoke and rework this convention. They complicate it by foregrounding the rhetorical constructedness of political issues. Their emphasis on the inevitable rhetoricity of politics has them problematize the conventional assumption that uh, the, genres, uh, the genre, genre's characters' rhetorical activities are to be oriented toward absolute yardsticks of truth and justice. Contemporary legal dramas are more hesitant to imagine truth and justice as absolute. In their story worlds, such extra discursive referent points make for slippery anchors, as they too can only be known and negotiated through linguistic and especially narrative means. Rather than extra discursive points of reference, it is the agents in such postmodern microcosms of law that recent shows point to as anchors for the rhetorical activity that is law and politics. In what appears to be a shift from referentiality to ethics, these shows charge the socially conscionable individual with the responsibility of managing the inevitable slipperiness of the knowledge and values that underwrite law and politics. Contemporary legal dramas pursue this project of dramatizing the rhetoricity of law and politics, not only through the kinds of stories they tell, but also by how they tell them. Their narrative strategies resonate with a set of techniques theorized by media scholar Jason Mittell, there's going to be a lot of echoes here, as narrative complexity, which he defines as a new paradigm of television storytelling that has emerged over the past two decades with the reconceptualization of the boundary between episodic and serial forms, a heightened degree of self-consciousness in storytelling mechanics, and demands for intensified viewer engagement focused on both diegetic pleasures and formal awareness. In the following, I want to flesh out some of this argument using two series as highly selective examples, The Good Wife and Damages. Damages, that first aired on the pay TV channel FX and later moved to DirecTV, exemplifies the kind of long-form TV storytelling that uh, Felix just talked about. It does so both in its narrative form, which builds on season-long story arcs rather than episodic narration, and in the openly political references and its storylines. In variance with the episodic conventions of TV legal drama, Damages narrates one case per season. And all five of these, there have been five seasons, all five of these encourage political readings by evoking issues of current political debate in ways that one New York Times review calls newsy, and more fundamentally, by raising questions about power and social justice. All of the cases that the series narrates revolves around some sort of corporate scandal in which the show's protagonists, the lawyers around main character Patty Hughes, represent the victims of corporate corruption. Fictional cases whose references to instances of corporate misconduct in the real world have been readily picked up by audiences and reviewers. The Enron scandal as inspiration for the first season's case of big business bankruptcy fraud, or the third season's evocations of the Bernie Madoff scandal, to name just two. While the series thus iterates a story about lawyers trying to hold corporate enterprises responsible for their abuses of power and to win damages for their victims, it refuses to idealize its lawyer figures. To the contrary, main protagonist Patty Hughes is as brilliant as she is ruthless, and her character takes to new extremes the figure of the lawyer who is willing to do whatever it takes to win her case a master manipulator whose repertoire includes the killing of pets and people, two things she does in the first season alone. 
Like other lawyer figures, Patty Hughes' brilliance rests in her ability to mold her cases into narratives that compellingly cast the opposing party as guilty. Her brilliance, in other words, is that of a scripter, director, narrator, based on a competence to compose and perform winning stories. Yet while many legal dramas type their lawyer characters into either good or bad based on whether or not their intradiegetic storytelling is grounded in truth and justice, Damages presents a world of law in which clean distinctions between true and untrue, just and unjust, do not exist. Petty uses actions may be governed by an ethics of taking down bullies, as she herself claims, but they regularly involve the violation of other characters' rightful interests. And um, the dead pets and people are really the tip of the iceberg here. Her lawyering for what may seem a politically good cause cuts a swath of destruction in ways also highlighted by the show's ambiguous title. And just as there is no absolute sense of justice that orients the protagonist's legal story making, there is no absolute truth. All alleged truths, all facts related to, to the show's diegetic cases are framed as positively or potentially manipulated because they are all inevitably the products of rhetorical construction. And these, as Patty Hughes teaches her protege, Ellen Parsons, in an early episode, are by default to be distrusted. Trust no one. A line echoing throughout season one that is, of course, ripe with intertextuality, as this was the tagline of The X-Files, a moment of intertextuality that reflects on the show's self-consciousness, which I'll say more about in a moment. What further distinguishes damages is that its protagonist's cautionary trust no one not only refers to the respective opposing parties in their legal confrontations, nor is it restricted to the characters' actions in the show's legal arenas. It applies, above all, to Patty Hughes herself and her interactions with her own clients, witnesses, and colleagues. The series particularly focuses on the relationship between Patty Hughes and Ellen Parsons, who starts working for Patty fresh out of law school and whose gradual understanding and contestation of her boss's maneuvers provides a focal point for much of the series' narrative. But the warning of uncertainty that damages has its protagonist issue reaches even further, applying not only to the series' story world, but only to its own storytelling. Damages notably employs nonlinear narration, developing its season-long stories from two points in their diegetic chronologies. One a point, their beginnings. Um, in season one, for example, that beginning is Alan Parsons deciding whether to work at Patty Hughes' law firm. And two, a point toward the end of those stories, near endings with which the first episode of each season actually start near endings that puzzlingly involve a main character in scenes of violence. Um, and again, as an example, at the onset of season one, we see Ellen Parsons covered in blood running away from a scene of murder that is entirely inexplicable at this point um, in the show's narration. The show's episode continually revisit both points in their chronology, moving the plot forward from both, but they primarily work on closing the gap between them. In the process, they develop intricate webs of storylines that pay much emphasis on unexpected twists and turns. What is more, the temporal design of the series of storytelling organized around this kind of gap sustains uh, the operational aesthetic that we just uh, talked about. Um, we also heard that Jason Mattel discusses as an element of narratively complex TV an invitation that such narratives extend to their viewers to wonder not so much what will happen next, but how this gap will be narratively closed. Or, in Mattel's words, an invitation to watch the gear at work, to marvel at the craft required to pull off such narrative pyrotechnics. And uh, when you look at how the series is discussed uh, in its fandom or in the general press, this is indeed what much of the discussion focuses on. I have here uh, two examples for you. The political potential of damages emerges especially at the intersection of the show's complex storytelling and its thematic engagement with the rhetoric of narrative in its story world of law. 
as Tony Papp notes in his discussion of the series' use of time, its story of legal scheming continuously points to the temporal scheming of the narrative itself, and vice versa, we may add. The series at once depicts and performs for the viewer a world of uncertainty, whose contingency it traces to the rhetorical nature of any knowledge about this world. The series does not bemoan this rhetoricity and the uncertainty that attends it as symptoms of a culture in crisis, chiefly by insisting that an alternative world of certainty simply does not exist. By focusing on the two lawyer characters, Patty Hughes and Ellen Parsons, and their negotiations of the conflictual demands of ethics and political efficiency in the world of law, the series rather directs attention to the question of personal responsibility in navigating such a postmodern world. I see something quite similar at work in The Good Wife, although formally this series is quite different from Damages. Aired by CBS since 2009, it is informed by the institutional context of network TV, a context that is less hospitable to experimentation with the conventions of TV storytelling. The show's major narrative rhythm is episodic. As a rule, its episodes are organized around individual cases which are introduced and concluded within one installment, if sometimes in an ambivalent or open-ended manner. However, the series interlaces its episodic narratives with larger story arcs that typically span over entire seasons in ways that add complexity to the characters and stories and thus render more elastic some of the limitations inherent in episodic narration. The series uses this complexifying potential also for its engagement with political issues, which, as in many other social issue courtroom dramas, openly reference items of current political discussion. Over the course of its four seasons today, The Good Wife has addressed issues ranging from capital punishment over the politics of the social media to repeatedly questions of corporate responsibility. What the series shares with Damages is the manner in which it addresses political issues, how it designs its stories and storytelling to explore how issues or cases are manufactured by means of language, narrative, or most fundamentally, signification. I want to single out one episode in which the series does that in a particularly meta-reflexive manner. The first season episode, Fixed. Let me give you a very brief synopsis. In this episode, the lawyers around main character Alicia Florick represent a young man who became paralyzed after taking a migraine medication, suing the company that manufactures the drug. So another case that thematizes the issue of corporate responsibility. While assisting the lead lawyer, Diane Lockhart, in arguing the case, Florick accidentally finds a slip of paper among the files that looks like this. She concludes that its 12 circles probably represent the jury, indicating that one of the jurors has been bribed, an interpretation shared by her bosses when she shows them the paper. But depending on how one turns the slip when looking at it, it could be two different jurors who were offered money. Florig and a colleague are dispatched to find out which juror has been bribed. They find no certain evidence, only hints that one juror might be susceptible to bribery, which they pass along to Diane Lockhart. Lockhart struggles with the decision how to use this unreliable information. She decides to tell the judge and immediately regrets it. The judge dismisses the juror in question, and the opposing counsel shows himself so happy about the dismissal that Lockhart suspects he planted the slip of paper to get rid of a juror unsympathetic to the interests of his client. Florg is withdrawn from her mission to find the bribed juror, and Lockhart argues the remainder of the trial without any consideration of possible tempering. And quite successfully so, she wins the case. After this happy ending, Florig accidentally finds out that it was not the opposing counsel who had bribed the juror, as they had always assumed, but their own client. The case that this episode narrates pinpoints in almost allegorical fashion the uncertainty that results from a dependence on slippery systems of signification, probing into its consequences for an institution that is engaged in the enforcement of social justice, the law. 
The scribbling on the slip of paper that Alicia finds appears as a set of vexingly slippery signifiers that resist fixing to stable reference, my take on the episode's title. At the beginning, the narrative emphasizes the uncertainty of the paper's very frame of reference. When Floric first shows the slip to her colleague, the latter responds, this could be anything, a seeding chart for a garden party, a football lineup. They eventually concur that the jury is the likely, though not certain, reference of the writing. Their discussion immediately vents the suspicion that the paper may have been planted by the, by the opposing side, that the scribbling may not refer to an actual bribery, that it may only simulate one. As they decide to explore the possibility of bribery, another uncertainty comes to the fore. The paper's ambiguous reference to either juror number two or juror number 11 as the potential recipient of the potential bribe. Much of the episode follows Florig and her colleague as they try to resolve this ambiguity. But until the very end, they do not find the kind of clues that would allow them to identify the bribee with any certainty. For the character who argues the case, Diane Lockhart, the central question is not so much to which juror the paper refers as what consequences it would have if she showed the paper to the judge. When Flory concludes her investigation, the trial is already far progressed and Lockhart thinks she is winning it. I feel like the jury was with me, the summation, they were nodding, they want to give this to us. Damn, this is roulette, this isn't law. Lockhart primarily grapples with the uncertainty of the paper's effect of the text of the trial she's trying to script, a text she wants to see concluded with a validation of her side of the story. As a potential piece of evidence, the paper matters less for its extra-textual referentiality than for its intra-textual effects, which are cast as similarly uncertain. The episode unfolds a third and final dimension of the paper's uncertainty. Its resolution suggests that the protagonist should not so much have worried about the paper's reference, nor about its intertextual effects, but about its authorship. This is the only aspect that the protagonists never call into question, the only point of which they feel certain. And to add yet another twist, the episode has this mistake not hurt, but ironically help the protagonists. Their misguided certainty that the opposing side would have initiated the bribe had prompted Lockhart to inform the judge of a potential tempering with the jury. And after responding to Lockhart's first allegation by replacing one juror, the judge refuses to consider this matter any further. If you have evidence of jury tempering, Ms. Lockhart, take it up on appeal. Too many people have selflessly invested their time for your playground tactics. This ruling absolves the protagonists from having to disclose their knowledge about the actual bribers to the court. A discussion of this obligation concludes the storyline in the episode. And I think within my three minutes, I managed to show you the scene because it's a very short scene and then we'll use it for a very quick wrap up. Regarding the dark green SUV, their license plate prefix is J15. There was no whistle blow. Our clients bribed the jury. Maybe. No, it's true. We need to bring this to the judge. We already did. We brought our suspicions to the judge and he overruled us. Yes, but now we know. We fulfilled our obligation under the law. It's wrong. No. We follow the law. Sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes it's right. But we always follow the law. And today we have to not make them pay to find justice. And this is really how this storyline ends in the episode. Um, this scene provides a notably ambiguous closure for the, stories, for the episode's story. The two characters involved disagree on the ethics of their case, and the episode does not really resolve their disagreement. It focalizes their disagreement on the question of justice. The scene's final word, a word claimed by both the discourses of law and ethics. 
A word whose usage in the phrase seeking justice for people in pain invokes a political idealism set off against the scene of the party at which the firm celebrates its victory. This ambiguity of justice here crystallizes the episode's overall strategy to unpack the uncertainties that inform any engagement with questions of social justice, uncertainties that owe to our dependence on slippery systems of signification when we want to turn these questions into issues or cases. The episode's meta-reflexive narrative of a legal case that presents itself almost as a case study in pro-structuralist theorizing should serve as my second and final example for the potentially new narrative politics in contemporary TV legal drama that I hypothesized about at the beginning of my paper. Focus on the rhetoricity of politics and exploration of its dynamics and consequences in story worlds of law. Thank you very much.